What's up, everybody? Welcome to the microcast. As usual, today's episode is hosted by me, TJ David, and Zoe Rome. On this week's episode, we're going to dive into our Chumbawamba moments from the past week, then get into what we're into, touching on my upcoming book tour and some key takeaways for athletes trying to balance the stresses of travel and training. Nice. The meat of our discussion today will be about the biggest obstacles we've faced in our running career so far and how we've worked through them. And as usual, we'll wrap it all up with some hot or not topics at the end. You won't want to miss out on that. Um, and just as an aside, if you're an athlete looking for support in your running journey or you've got a question or a topic you'd like us to address here, send us an email, microcosmcoaching at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. So TJ, I'm curious to hear about your Chumbawamba moment. You've been traveling. We haven't seen each other in almost a week. Um, how's it going? How you been? <laughs> Get, yeah, I've got both feet on the ground right now. I feel, I feel pretty good. Um, it's been a big summer. You know, I think I've been, I've been thinking a lot about um, working remote mm. and the positives, the pros and cons of working remote. And I, I like the idea of working remote. But so when you say working remote, you mean not at Microcosm World Headquarters. Yeah, yeah, not here. Because <laughs> like, home, to in be my clear, office. we are technically remote, right? Like we're not at like a, we don't have a brick and mortar that's not in our house. Okay. But we do call our house Microcosm World Headquarters. Okay. Yes, I have an office where I have everything laid out. I've got every, a giant ass desk, big desk, everything that I need to reference in a day of coaching or working with my, you know, my coaches, anything business wise that I need. Um, I've got it all like right there and I know where it all is. And so when I talk about working remote, I'm talking about like not being in like my right. office away from that big desk energy that you usually have. Yeah. Like, I don't know if it's a big desk energy, but I'm more There's like There's some big desk energy in the microcosm world headquarters. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I like my, I like just having my office, you know, I feel like things are compart well compartmentalized in there. You know, if I'm in there, I'm usually working. And so it's just easy to switch on and off. Um, but I've always just like, kind of like, like the idea of working remote and we've tried it, you know, like I've gone to France and worked remote while on, you know, ski mountaineering trips. I've gone to Canada and worked remote um, while on ski mountaineering trips. I've, I'm um, trying to think where else, you know, various different places, Arkansas, Denver, Boulder, um, you know, Utah, we've, we've, and yeah, we've worked remote from a number of places. Mexico. And, Mexico. And like, I just, I got to say, like, it just always feels like an epic failure to me mm, when I'm mm -hmm. working remote. Like we have so many athletes who work remote and I just like, I love the idea of it so much. I just like being able to work from anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I just cannot seem to figure it out. Mm. And I was traveling with, for family obligations, um, over the last week. And like, I just, you know, I've got, I need to take time off around the Leadville 100. I just did not want to take time off. Uh, we have so many, I'm, I have so many folks who are racing right now and I'm trying to be very present and available. And, and so, you know, it's, I didn't want to take the time off. And then like, I always have that, like that kind of back and forth of like, okay, what am I working? What am I not working? When am I giving feedback to athletes? When am I not? When am I communicating with my coaches? When am I not? Like, mm -hmm. I'm also trying to fit the training in there. And it just always feels, I just, I don't know. I just have to give props to anybody who, you know, travels the world, works remote <laughs> and like actually feels like they're getting good work done. And I know I'm getting good work done, um, but I don't feel like I have the control that I want um, and like to feel at the control over the process, the coaching yeah. process for me. I yeah. just don't enjoy yeah. it. I, no, feel I, hear, like I hear that. And I think that like, 
oh, so often what like really grates me about of like a lot of productivity hack style writing kind of presupposes that like, oh, like if you just like find like there's one correct way of getting good work done. And I find that it's so, so, so individual. Like you and I have really different work styles and really different work habits, but are about like equally productive and successful when we're able to perform within those constraints. And so I think that like, it's really just about figuring out what works for you and then setting yourself up for success and not like, I think that maybe some of this stuff feels more acute for you because we see other people in our lives who are really adept at it. And maybe you hold yourself to an unfair standard, but we have no idea what those people look like day in, day out at, you know, their own microcosm world headquarters. <laughs> I just like to feel differently than I felt. You're a creature of habit. Yeah. Oh, totally. I love to have my habit, my, you know, my routines, get up, meditate, train. And then the rest of the day, you know, is coaching and working on the business. And then after that, you know, I usually do a second bout of training and that's kind of like the signal to my brain that the work day is over and it's time to stop being a coach and being, you know, these other parts of my identity. And yeah, it's just it's so blurry when you're working remote. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity and I acknowledge that I just, I feel like I've tried so many times and like, I just don't enjoy it. Yeah. And so I want to, I don't know, my Chumbawamba moment is like, I keep trying to work remote and I just keep falling down. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it feels yeah. like. Well, you know, I think that like <laughs> maybe using that information, you'll just either set better boundaries or like when you travel just take off as much time as you can in the future and not do as much like quote unquote gray zone training when you work remotely like yeah. the work equivalent of gray zone training well the part about getting up kind of plays into what we're what the what we're into portion of this call so i don't want to oh. do too much spoiling yeah. but i feel like there's a lot of great insights that come from working remote especially for athletes who you know, are also trying to train, have a goal coming up, but can't help um, but travel. I mean, this was not really a negotiable travel situation for me. Um, right in the middle of Leadville 100 training, about five weeks out from the event. Typically, that would be a boot camp week or a peak week for an athlete. And for me, that was not. Um, oh, yeah. Can, I mean, similar, like I yeah. had to go to the Boston Marathon and then a friend's wedding during my peak week for the Argentina 50 miler. But Anyways, I have some really great takeaways there that are applicable on the training side, but just, you know, as a, a personal note, um, just don't love working remote. I just yeah. like being home. Um, I like being in my office. Yeah. Hear that. I hear that. All right. What are you thinking about this week? Ooh, what's my chumba wumba moment? Um, so I am releasing a book on August 17th or August 18th, becoming a sustainable runner, pre-order a copy now. And it is a really vulnerable process of like going on a bunch of podcasts, trying to organize events. And that's not like self-promotion isn't my happy place. I love doing the work. And now it's time for me to like put the work on a shelf and start bringing attention to the work to kind of like honor and validate the work I did. And it's just like, that's hard for me. That really is my growth edge, asking people to care about the things I care about, asking people to read this thing that I spent multiple years writing, like a, literally multiple, multiple years, two to three years. And that's hard. I don't, you know, it. <laughs> I'm thankful that we're in the height of Leo season because I'm going to need to draw on all of my Leo powers to kind of own this process and to keep, you know, stretching myself and promoting this work I've done with my with my dear friend, Tina Muir. So I don't know. It's like, it's just really vulnerable asking people to like show up for you in this way. Um, but I also feel that like in the process of writing this book, it brought me much closer to my community and much closer to my values. And I'm optimistic that if I continue to promote and do the book tour in a way that's in alignment with my values, that organically the right people will connect with this work. Mm, totally. And I like how you're kind of leaning on on that inner knowing there and coming from that place of abundance when confronted with vulnerability, because that brings up all of those things. I'm not enough. I feel scarce. I have to yeah. prove that this book is great. Like I have to prove that. Or I Like who am I to ask for attention? Like who am mm -hmm. I to deserve the attention that's being paid to this? Who am I to be an environmental advocate? And I'm trying to put those feelings aside and just trust that the work will speak for itself. And also just like you have to like 
you just the way that the economy works, you have to draw people's attention to stuff. It's not enough to just create a badass book. You have to spend time and resources um, getting people's attention to it. So that's, you know, that definitely challenges me because I'm much more interested in doing the work than talking about the work. But if you don't talk about the work, no one's going to see the work. And I desperately want people to see the work. Mm, I find that really interesting because you're so great at breaking down big topics and talking about them in a clear and concise way that people can understand. And I think and wonder if the vulnerability part of this is what's really the most challenging, right? Because like, this is your book. Yeah. So this is like your My emptiness book. Right. And you guys consolidated all of these ideas and thoughts and put them into one thing. And so, you know, there's a lot of ownership over that, that you have to have. And that, you know, makes it, um, you know, you're opening yourself up for critical feedback, challenging oh, yeah. feedback. And I think that there's an underlying, an underlying part of this process is being vulnerable and having courage, even if feedback is not what you're looking for or accepting that there could be a lot of inherent gifts in um, doing this process, stepping into. Totally. Yeah. But I mean, cause like you. a big part of our message is encouraging people to be imperfect advocates. So I just really have to take my own advice here and allow myself to be imperfect, which I freaking hate. It is not comfortable. I want to be perfect. I want to be seen as perfect. I want to be seen as like beyond reproach. And those are just not realistic expectations of myself or any human. So I'm just trying to keep showing up as I am in the hopes that me doing that will encourage other folks to do so in their own communities and in their own climate work and in their own training. Such a great way to work on perfectionism. Oh, exposure therapy is a hell of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, man, I think the, the listeners will agree that good on you for putting yourself in this uncomfortable position. And this is where all the growth yeah. happens. And uh, pre-order your copy today at becomingasustainablerunner.com. Oh, TJ, nice. I'm curious what you're into right now. Again, we haven't talked in like about a week. Well, we like texted a couple times, but what are you into? What's going on? Like you've, you know, you had your Chumbawamba moment. You got knocked down. You got back up again. What are you thinking about right now? Yeah, I'm not sure I got back up. I just accepted. You're getting I back up. Accepted. <laughs> I, I accepted that, you know, working remote, it pushes my inner desire to, you know, to control and to be in control of my work environment and my time. And, um, you know, I think the the hidden gifts in in that whole thing are, you know, having to work on those things and getting the opportunity to work on um, you know, working at different times of the day that I normally would training at mm -hmm. different times of the day that I normally would. And, um, just, you know, developing and knowing that everything will be okay if you're not on your routine and, um, doing things as you would always do them if you were at home working in your vacuum. Yeah. Um, but it led me to, to think a lot about, you know, how to balance training and travel because mm. I've got, so many folks um, on my roster, and I know we do it in microcosm in general, who are constantly balancing uh, work, travel, and right. their training. Yeah. And um, so I was on the East Coast. It was incredibly humid. Uh, we're talking about 90 to 100% humidity. Wow. Uh, it's like stepping into a pool in all your running clothes and then, you know, then going for the run. Hashtag stay wet. Very wet. It's beyond the part of staying wet where it's like advantageous it's, for keeping it's your It's less about cool. staying wet. You just become the wet. You are one. Like you just one become with the there. Wet. It's just, it's. <laughs> the wet becomes you. I, I mean, I've never had so many runs where like. I'm four miles in and I'm like, uh, <laughs> how am I doing a 90 minute run today? Um, and it just like feeling so tired and, um, like almost destroyed by the conditions like, yeah. it, with the humidity. It just feels so hard to run fast. Yeah. Like you're running through, like, I don't know, you've got like a resistance band behind you and someone's <laughs> like pulling you back the whole time. And so I guess the main takeaway is, and this is something that we've, you know, we've known a lot about, but I, I don't tend to travel and train 
too, too much. Um, especially in summer, we tend to be pretty Colorado based and then we'll do like a trip on a weekend and train and then come back home. And it's not like I spend like a week training somewhere else. And so, you know, something I keep the big message really is one, um, set an intention Mm. for your time when you're traveling. I'm curious if you could share your intention with us. I was intentionless. Oh, so this is a, this is a, this is hindsight. This is hindsight. Excellent. Hindsight. Love yeah, it. exactly. Like I kind of like tried to embody this as I go. Cause I, I think like in the past, you know, we've gone places and, and tried to like have like epic training vacations or whatnot, like Hawaii this past year. Mm, great mm-hmm. example of that. Where it's just like, you just can't even run on the trails there. It's I not think fun. What is helpful for me. And like you speak of intention setting, I think vocalizing what my expectations are around things so that we can have an honest conversation and you can reality check my sometimes like uh, Brene Brown calls them stealth expectations because I won't say anything out loud, but I'll just like expect in my head that like, I'll be able to go do, you know, I'll be able to run 12 miles. It's going to happen exactly on the trailhead. We picked out knowing nothing. It's going to happen exactly on the time frame I expect and everything's just going to go flawless and we're going to have a great time and we're going to just interpersonally crush it. <laughs> and that just is never the reality. And I think something that was helpful about our trip to Hawaii this spring was that I started being able to be like, my expectations were this. And you were like, Zoe, I love you. We can't have that. Like we just, we've learned that those expectations are inappropriate. Um, And you helped me kind of reality check some of those expectations I was bringing into like being able to like perfectly execute peak training while we're in a new place. And like all of these things that I think that in my head, I thought were going to be doable and I needed to hear lovingly someone I trust say, you know, I like that ambition, but like, let's, let's take a realistic look at what resources we have available. Yeah. And I think that that, you know, that was a great teacher, that trip. Um, And I was definitely thinking a lot about that this past week and continuing to think about, you know, how, how do I work with my athletes when they're traveling um, and something that athletes don't often do is contextualize the the trip and set an intention. Um, you know, what are we trying to gain from this? Mm. Is this a vacation? If it's a vacation, why are we trying to do a lot of training volume? You know, like it, the volume should be rolled back mm, significantly. Mm-hmm. The focus and priority should be vacationing, relaxing. Right. But resetting. I think being able to maintain some base of consistency is also important, right? Like we don't want to go too far off either side of the spectrum. Mm. I, oh, I okay. just, I think consistency is important, but are we trying to continue to adapt and provoke new adaptations? No, I'm or talking about like we... when I have athletes who are like, oh, I'm going to, you know, Costa Rica. Can I take 10 days out of my training? I'd prefer to have not athletes not taking 10 days off, but Correct. to maintain consistency, run every other day, run every few days. Right. I always have folks run for time, run with flexibility. We're not doing intensity. We're not doing hill strides. You know, I tell folks like treadmills, great. If you're hiking, that's also pretty great, but we do need to maintain a certain amount of like, you know, ground contact so that we don't have to like re ramp up training on the other side as injury mitigation. Totally. And just to be clear, we're not advocating for breaks and we'll talk about that more later in the call. And there's a lot of uh, serious downsides to taking extended breaks Um, but I'm talking about setting that intention, being clear with what the priority is for that trip. You know, my priority was time with my family, um, very important time with my family on this past week. And so I made adjustments to my training um, that helped to keep me, I don't know, more present than I would normally be because training is exhausting. It's very tiring. You're peaking in a build for 100. Like if you are going all in on your training and then adding travel stress to that, environmental stress through heat and humidity, uh, it's pretty likely you're going to show up to family events not feeling 100% your best. Right. And I really wanted to make sure that that wasn't going to happen. So I was constantly dialing back my effort. And something that was you know, pretty interesting is I had a couple really heavy workouts um, assigned by my coach during, during the trip because, oh, it's great. You're at low elevation. And so you get to maximize your speed. But I think with diminishing 
results as a result of the fact that it was so humid. You can't mm -hmm. even really be fast. Uh, you, it would take more time than I had to acclimate to the humidity to really be able to access my speed. Um, but you know, roll like when you really think about this stuff, it's just so important to have that intention. You know, right. what is the intention of, of that trip? The intention was to stay consistent, try to reset a little bit because, uh, coming off a big week, going down in elevation to sea level, great opportunity for better sleep. Um, and so just trying not to like add extra stress, but keeping the iron in the flame, so to speak, keeping mm -hmm. the, the pot on the burner, um, letting things simmer, trying, you know, not necessarily coaxing out ad extra adaptations and right. like really having that intention, I think, um, you know, helped like as I added that in and contextualized things over the course of the week like that. It allowed me to loosen my grip and lower my expectations around the training um, because travel is just like such a big stress. Sleeping in hotels, you're not going to get the best sleep. Um, traveling in an airplane, going through airports, all of that. Eating like, food that's yeah. not your normal food. It's, you know, it has an impact. And the longer that travel is sustained, the longer that impact is up to a point where then you can probably adapt to it and it becomes a baseline. Right. But that's, you know, a considerable amount of time. So I think the big, you know, the big thing I, I want to continue to do in my training is continue to be more transparent and tell my coach, okay, this is the intention of this trip. This is not a running trip. This is an X, Y, and Z trip. Here's what I can do. Here's what the time I have available maybe this week should be bigger before, maybe the week after, ease into it, and then bigger on the weekend, that adjustment back to elevation. I don't know, whatever it is for your circumstances, your training and your goals, but being very clear. And I have mm -hmm. a lot of athletes who often just like put a comment in the, in the training log with me where it's like, okay, travel, but like the, or vacation. And it's just like, they don't really contextualize it with like, what is oh, the intention? Totally. Yeah. I always what ask my for? athletes to tell me if they need full rest or reduced volume. So I do have them help me contextualize it and share the context of the trip to the extent they feel comfortable. As you should, but I want to invite athletes forward to not wait for me to uh, prompt you on right, right, everything right. Yeah. and to, you know, you're going on that trip. You planned it. Um, you often have an idea of what you want to do. And uh, it's important to recognize, and you know, I'll say this as a note for myself, it's important <laughs> to recognize you can't have it all. Right. You might want to have it all. Oh, yes. You might want to smash that low elevation training. Um, but, but humidity has yeah. other plans for so, you. So um, ask for what you need. I'm continuing to do that as an athlete. I recognize where I could do better. Um, this trip was pretty good overall, but more... For me, more so, um, I had to continue to reevaluate, lower the expectations, come into alignment with the intentions that I had set, check in with my coach and make sure we were on the same page, get that feedback, and then you know use that to then continue to try to hit the underlying intention of the week, which was to not overstress, which is just to keep consistency going, stay, keeping that stoke going. Um, you know, maintaining all of the good training that we've been doing. Hmm. So I think there's yeah. just a lot of, of, of really good lessons in there for athletes. Um, and just don't forget, like travel is a stress. Yes. Stress and stress is stress, right? Like just because like, and you know, losing sleep, like actual travel stress from like missed connections and like delayed flights, like remember to take into account all of your stress and communicate that stuff with your coach and give yourself as much flexibility as possible and collaborate with your coach to build a training plan that is going to set you up for success. I would always rather we plan conservatively and execute well than like overload ourselves and then look back and be like, shoot, we only did 30% of what we thought we could do. And now I need to like retroactively replan a bunch of other stuff. I think it's always better to be realistic than optimistic when it comes to these things. And again, that comes from like a deep awareness of, I tend to I, that's my number one area for growth in this process. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. You could do better at telling your coach when you're traveling ahead of time. 
I just never, I always am just like, yeah, I'll make it work. And then there's been times where like, you know, we'll land somewhere at 11 PM and I'm like, I don't know if I can make this work. <laughs> right. Trying to get that double. And it's just like, that's just insane. That's like, not, there's no, that's not the move. There's no reason to do that. You know, we were talking about that before hard rock, you know, when we weren't able to do our doubles that Thursday, I mean, I was just... pretty cool letting it go though. Cause I yeah. was just like, you know what? Like four miles is nothing. Like that is not even a drop in my bucket of training at this point. And more often than not, I get the four miles. So I really didn't feel stressed at all. And also we went, we went and immediately got Thai food. So I was pretty over it by the time we made that call. You've got a lot of experience. Just, I'm getting better. I'm progressing. You know, putting these ideas into action and then decisions become easier as a result of that. And that's, that's really what you're illustrating. There. Yeah, exactly. All right, what are you into? You saw Barbie? I is saw that a movie? Barbie. It's a movie. It is the movie. Um, I went with all the women from my comedy group to go see it. And I had it was just like the most amazing movie going experience I've had in my whole life. It was so awesome. So much amazing, like female identifying solidarity in the theater. People of all ages. I was laughing nonstop. It is definitely the funniest movie I've ever seen. It's also the highest grossing comedy ever made. Oh. Yeah, already. Like epic. Yeah. So epic. Directed by one of my favorite directors, directors, Greta Gerwig, who did Little Women and Lady Bird, which are two of my other favorite movies. And I have just never felt so deeply seen by a film before in my life. I've never felt as seen in terms of it being like so, so funny and so, so unafraid to lean into tough issues and to navigate them imperfectly and to do so in a way that felt like serious, but joyful. And it really took its characters who, I mean, yes, are dolls, but it takes them and their emotional motivation really, really seriously and Ryan Gosling acted the hell out of being Ken. And it was just such a funny, funny, fantastic movie experience. And it really like for me has reanimated this feeling of like, everyone has a story that only they can tell. And I feel like this movie was a consequence of a lot of people coming together to tell their story in the process there without spoiling it. There's a moment at the end of the movie where Barbie is emotionally connecting with um, like the woman who, plays with her in the real world and the director used all this home footage of all the women who worked on the film the like footage of like home footage of them being children like being mothers like going to the beach just doing things and it was this amazing illustration of our capacity to create amazing novel generative stories and particularly women to have that capacity, which often hasn't been aligned. Like that's not something that women have like historically been allowed or empowered to do. And I just thought that this film illustrated that in such, again, like a jubilant, funny, anarchic way. Um, it's my new favorite movie for sure. I'm obsessed with it. I can't wait to see it again. I'm going to see it like three more times in the theater for sure. I, I just, yeah, go see it. <laughs> totally worth the hype. I, I didn't feel like I was super sucked into the hype going into the movie. I just generally tend to be like a big fan of going to movies. And because it's Greta Gerwig, I was in from the jump, um, which like I wouldn't necessarily like see myself as the number one candidate for loving the Barbie movie. But it was just so heart forward. It was so funny. It was so deeply human. I'm I'm all about it. 11 out of 10 stars. Awesome. Well, seal of approval. Yeah. I'm sure. A lot Microcosm of movie <laughs> reviews. A few hundred people will go see yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome, Warner Brothers. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. Well, I love it. I think there's some really great stuff in there. And let's uh let's talk about let's get into the meat here. Um setbacks the big setbacks we've had in our running journeys the biggest challenges the biggest mm. like what is the stuff that almost what's the stuff that we really feel like as being career defining challenges in our journeys to becoming runners yeah you want to i kind of want to start with you actually because i feel like it's been a really tough year for you and i'm just yeah you know i think that like you had kind of an inflection point in your personal and professional running career this year where you had to really take a step back and like had to like consciously choose to continue running. Like there was, there was a time where I think it would have been very, very easy for you to throw your hands up and say, I'm done with this. And I'm curious if you can walk us through what happened and what you learned from that. 
Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. Put me on the spot. Yeah, I would say probably the the biggest challenge that I've I've dealt had to deal with was the health challenge that I had um starting almost a year ago now, August August of last year, uh about the time I went out for CCC um went out to Chamonix, France to start training. I had um a really bad day on the trails in Boulder. Um, and felt like I had some kind of allergy attack. Um, I couldn't breathe and I just wasn't able to, something was going on with, Mm. with my nervous system or my immune system. Um, and that was kind of the start of it. And it, and it took several hours for me to like, I had to walk out of the run and I left for France, like a little bit concerned, like, what was that? Yeah. Um, and it kind of reminded me and like in hindsight looking back there was a few other similar episodes but not as like so obvious as that one you know when when you've had like a, a big episode that's like oh i can't breathe i'm like hyperventilating i can't catch my breath i can't even catch my breath at a walk um you know you have such a powerful uh visceral experience then when you think about it in hindsight, you're like, Oh, I kind of had some mini episodes like that. Like Mm, at other times, mm -hmm. what was going on there were those little red flags that I didn't notice. And I, you know, I've talked about this on previous calls, but that was an inflection point for me with work stress. Um, and as you know, now months and months, out from this and having figured out um after seeing you know the race at ccc obviously people can listen to the recap did not uh go as well as i was hoping especially considering how great my training was um but i gutted that out and and finished um yeah and i'm not i'm I'm proud of that but i'm not sure if like that set me back worse Mm. but the months after that that breathing issue um, not being able to catch my breath on any runs, having to walk, having vertigo on a lot of runs. And just like crazy headaches and head congestion. Nausea. Um, and eventually it turned out that I be- had, after going to a series of doctors, at one point they said I was allergic to exercise, which was... Not the news we were hoping <laughs> for. <laughs> it was like, your body's allergic to, his- <laughs> to the histamine that you create as a as a stress hormone during exercise. I'm like, oh, great. So I can't <laughs> exercise anymore. What are my other options? What are my, like, uh, that's like all <laughs> I do basically, yeah. um, for ever. <laughs> so, uh, that's great news. Um, but uh, that was pretty fringy that yeah. diagnosis, not even, I would say theory, yeah. uh, by a doctor here in Carbondale. And then I actually went to an allergist to discuss that and like, they gave me an allergy test and I have never had allergies, um, in ever and not to food, not to plants, animals, nothing. And they gave me an allergy test and, uh, my, they prick you on your back and basically my whole back just started, they prick you with allergens on your back, Yeah, local allergens to plants, grasses, trees, your pets, all that kind of stuff. And my whole back just like lit up super, super itchy. Um, had to take like double dose of antihistamines, like right after, and it didn't even do anything. Uh, and the doctor came in and was just like, listen, dude, you're severely allergic to 25 outdoor allergens, everything that you, the environment you run and train in you're allergic to. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well that, and he's <laughs> but like, I'm not allergic to the exercise, <laughs> Yes, but not exercise. Right. He's like, probably not. <laughs> he's like, you're just breathing this stuff in all the time when you go out and train and there, and you know, that's why it's making it harder and harder to breathe. And like, fortunately it, uh, I did, um, two different tests for my lungs and was in the 99th percentile for lung capacity. Great news. Great news. <laughs> it, it didn't really affect my respiratory system. Yeah. But we, yeah, like 
I, I guess being so wrecked after CCC kept me from training more. Mm. And so like kept me from destroying my system completely, but somehow leading up to CCC, I developed all these allergies and yeah. it, that basically was not able to function right. outside. And it is also like, I think it should be clear, like this is a chronic condition and those kinds of diagnoses are really challenging, right? Like it's, and there is no magic pill for this. There is ongoing, pretty challenging, pretty um, somewhat invasive treatment. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think that like my, I just really think about a lot of the athletes we have on the team who've gotten similar sort of like diagnoses, like Kylie has been working through some chronic health challenges, but like training, you know, as consistently as she can throughout, right? Like looking at an athlete like her and athletes like you, it was never on the table to quit, right? Like you're yeah. kind of like, you're starting from that assumption of as long as it's like medically healthy, I'm going to continue running. What systems can I support myself with around that? And we have lots of athletes on the team who have a similar approach, right? Who like, yeah, have gotten some like tough, um, you know, tough sort of like diagnoses, but a lot of folks, again, like with the, the blessing and support of a medical team around them, continue the train. I think there's other folks who like in their heart of hearts, maybe aren't as dedicated to the running and it could be a health diagnosis, but it also could be like anything. And they use that as permission to disconnect from the training rather than a challenge to see what resources their body needs and to meet those resources. And then I think that that for me, you know, was the entire almost epiphany and, and wake up moment. And I asked my doctor, you know, how could this happen? Like I've yeah. never had allergies and he's like, probably stress. Mm. How did you feel hearing that? It was challenging because, you know, I, I think I tend to feel like I have to be operating at a hundred percent capacity all the time mm. to feel like I'm, you know, a good coach to feel like I'm, uh, perpetuating the growth of my business forward for the betterment of trail running and running culture in general, and for my coaches and to support them and all of their athletes. And like, I feel like I've really had to, I mean, this whole situation as challenging as it has been, has been the biggest gift because it's forced me to confront parts of my work ethic that were really unhealthy and were leading me, you know, weren't even leading me, cre created a situation where I ruined my, my immune function. Essentially, I destroyed my immune system uh, because I was not taking enough time for myself. I yeah. wasn't doing self-care enough, you know, one 10 minute meditation a day is not enough if you're coaching a lot of folks working eight hours a day and training two hours a day like it's just not enough and working six, six days a week yeah it's not enough and you know being a coach um for me in my experience five years full time it's and and in the past you know coaching in other sports for a long time too um coaching has a very strong mental and emotional component to it for me and I often, my battery can get drained. And as a, and if I continue to push through that, that's when, you know, all the red flags right. pop up for me. And like, I've kind of a developed or I had developed an association between like, that's where the good work happens. Mm. Like I need those red flags to be popping up as validation. Right. Like if I'm not work. overtrained, am I even training? Yeah. Yeah. But and for work. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, it's. It's not that I didn't know I was doing that. I just felt like that was the right thing to do. And I think <laughs> that there was... I know that I'm making a mistake, but I'm definitely going to continue to make it <laughs> until I meet the consequences of it. I And I think that's how it goes for a lot of people. But there was no... Um, there was no obvious way I was going to quit. You know, the doctor yeah. was like, you have to start running indoors. I got on three different um, prescription drugs and antihistamines. And after several weeks of consistently taking those i felt wrecked so tired um and like no energy but i did start to be able to breathe better yeah and then i started to have like less of this head fog and like all of this like other symptoms that i was getting so like you know i was able to start to exercise on the treadmill and then do um 
some short runs and especially like so lucky with the timing on this fall the leaves were coming down and there was just some moments I had a couple moments where I was like oh I kind of feel like I'm running I was running outside and feeling yeah. good but I had to to change so many habits um unlearn stories uh, and associations between that were unhealthy for me between you know the work ethic and self-care and validation and people pleasing and all of these things that I think in the end were making me a worse coach yeah um and a worse athlete I'm I'm curious on the bad days what gave you the courage to persevere because I think this is a circumstance that a lot of folks would encounter and they would throw up their hands and say like is it worth it to keep running like the running is so hard it's not easy right now I have to do less of it than I want to and the amount that I can do doesn't feel that great what gave you the courage like where did the drive to continue to pursue running come from it comes from deep within, you know, that wanting and knowing that you still have more to give and you're not willing to, you know, it's not like a, I wasn't willing to quit just because I was going through like a pretty serious setback and, and like behind the scenes, you know, every sponsor that I had dropped me. Um, and that really was upsetting. <laughs> particularly a brand that I'd been with for seven years and one of, was one of their original founding athletes in the US, uh, just straight up dropped me and didn't want to be on the journey with me. I, you know, thinking about that now, I find that just completely unacceptable um, that you don't, you know, believe in and support people. Um, mm. So unethical. I have a lot to say about that. Maybe not for today. It's <laughs> I mean, yeah, like they're, they're businesses. They're not, you know, they're, they don't deal in ethics to be, you know. You know what? I'm a coach and <laughs> I believe deeply in the potential of every single one of my athletes. Yeah, no I do always what. find it funny when pros post like, oh, like thanks to this brand for sticking with me through injury. And I think that's often great, but we never see the stories of folks for whom that isn't the case because they often have to sign NDAs or they're like not empowered to say like, hey, this brand dropped me as soon as I wasn't a moneymaker for them. Like as soon as I said I was uncomfortable posting about my health issues or like my parenthood journey on Instagram, they dropped me. And there's lots of stories like that. And I think that, you know, I, you know, I, I'm just always very suspect of anyone overly commending a brand because like at the end of the day, it's a business. They, they're, they view you as an asset to their business. That's correct. That's correct. But I will never stop investing in my potential. I know that I'm capable of more than I'm doing now and will be doing in the future. And I just, that's my attitude. Yeah. That's my way of being. And to fast forward six to nine months from this really, you know, challenging setback, challenging diagnosis, you've been on the podium at every race you've lined up for since then. Yeah. How does that feel? <laughs> for my ego with regard to <laughs> those, those brands? Just for, for TV, yeah. <laughs> right. No. <laughs> uh, no, it feels really good uh, in my, you know, for my essential self, because I, I know that I have more to give and... It, it's not just in my athletic career, you know, it's, it's recognizing where I needed to pump the brakes and coaching and the things I need to do to make this business more sustainable so we can continue to deliver a really high quality and level of service to our athletes to help each and every person that comes through our doors achieve their goals and even more importantly, take running and use it as a microcosm that elevates their quality of life, because that's really the stuff that when you get down to it with the people who have been doing this for long enough, that's really why they do this. Right. It's not because they're accomplishing cool goals. It's because running elevates their lives and it takes time to get there. But that's what happens when you give it that chance. And so like running has elevated my life in so many ways that there's no way I was going to, you know, be, you know, if the doctor is like, you can never run again outside. I was like, well, you know, awesome. I've got some <laughs> top chef reruns to watch. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do whatever I can explore every Avenue to, 
you know, repair my immune system. So that way I can go outside and run in, where there are allergies. And I'm still, I still have allergy issues. I'm not taking the medications as much, which is great. Um, I, I actually kind of struggled back on the East coast, but it's not dehabilitating right. where I can't do the work. Uh, I have to cut run short and it, you know, I really, I worked a lot with my coach. Like he had no idea what the hell I was going through. He never had dealt with somebody dealing with this and instant you know, onset extreme allergies. Yeah. Like, and no, it's like totally bizarre. Yeah. Um, I've never dealt with that in my coaching. And like, you know, this is one of those things where you put a plan in place, but you really learn to just take each day as it comes. And like the result of that approach, it's not like we didn't have a plan. We didn't have structure. We didn't have workouts. We really reduced the stress significantly, especially over winter. But then like all of a sudden as a result of that, and then working on my boundaries, coaching less athletes, reworking, you know, my habits and routines around work, um, getting more comfortable doing things in a different way that put me first. Um, and still it feels selfish to say to put myself first. Um, but that's what has to be done. If I'm pouring from an empty cup, you know, working with my athletes, I'm not going to be giving them my best. I'm not going to be giving my best to my training, to my, to you, to any of my relationships, to the things that I cultivate outside of running, you know, the hobbies that I have that I got to lean on during this time, which were really awesome. Um, you know, you build those tools throughout the process, not hoping for a moment to use them, but knowing that if a moment comes, you have those tools to draw on. Right. And I had the tools and the support system. And there was like a lot of like figuring out what was going on. Um, but once I figured out what was going on, it was like about listening to my body, not holding too mm. closely to the training, all I'm, of that kind I'm of stuff. I'm curious, <laughs> given everything that you worked through, what like specific pieces of advice would you have for athletes who are struggling with challenging like health diagnoses or like physical setbacks, injury, illness? What do you, what advice do you have? I would say don't, I would say it's okay to take a step back to integrate the information that you're receiving, but don't use it as an opportunity to quit. Like mm. if you've got a coach you're working with, like that's the time to double down on your communication with that coach and that support. Um, if you've got, I don't know, a therapist or a mental performance coach or a PT or any number of practitioners that you work with, like that's a chance to double down and look for new avenues and ways to leverage those relationships. I mean, like I have had, I have a lot of different folks on my team at this point and it would have been easy to just like, I mean, for some people it would be easy just to walk away from those relationships, but I use them as opportunity to kind of discuss what I was going through and then get different perspective on it. And like, when, as soon as you put that holistic lens on your problem, I think you're much more likely to have a positive outcome. Cause it's like never just one thing that causes this. Like right. this wasn't just work stress that caused right, this. Right. This was work and training and like a whole bunch of stuff accumulating together. And it took like a 30,000 foot view to step back and be like, okay, like, so like, what do we need to do here? Um, and, you know, running that by people who you trust is super, super important. Even if they're not experts, they can offer a perspective that you wouldn't be able to see. Mm. And so my thought is like, when you come up into one of these challenges, like that's the time to double down mm. and say, I'm going to invest in myself. I'm going to see what I can learn from this. I'm going to see what I can do on the other side. Right. And where can I get to? You I love know, that. And the result of that is, yeah, like I'm running the best that I've ever run. I think I'm coaching the best that I've ever coached. And, you know, our business at Microcosm is just totally crushing it. And we're, you know, I'm just, I couldn't be in a better place right now. Um, even though there are tons and millions of little <laughs> challenges every single sure. day and week, yeah. but like overall, um, you know, I'm in a much better place than I was as a result of having to go through this. Um, yeah. And I think like 
it didn't take much time for me to be like, you know what? Like, I don't need the validation of sponsorships. Yeah. Like I am my own brand. Like I created a business. I'm going to represent my business. I'm going to represent my athletes and my coaches wherever I go. Like those are, you know, I can yeah. give myself the opportunities. I'll take myself to Argentina and race and get on a podium there. Like I'll do, you know, I can do that brand help. What, like, what is that? You know, yeah. did they really help me that much? No. Was it great for my ego? Yeah. Basically that was what it fueled. Mm -hmm. Didn't really fuel like the deep parts of me that really sustained the process through a challenge. Yeah. Wow. All right. That was a Amazing lot. Amazing learnings though. Yeah. <laughs> That was a lot, but you know, that was a, that was a um, big challenge. Yeah. And very multi multifaceted in many respects. As they usually are. All right. Let's talk about your challenges, Zoe. Ugh, I feel like my challenge is like, hi, it's me. I'm the challenge. I think a lot of people could relate <laughs> to that. <laughs> um, I can't really point to anything super external. And I think I can honestly say um, a lot of the time, my biggest challenge is getting out of my own way. I think when I came into the sport, um, I came in with a lot of baggage that I had learned from like a cultural narrative of what an athlete looks like, what an athlete is. And coming into running, I had like zero athletic background. Like I literally, I tried out for and did not make my junior high cross country team. Um, I played volleyball, but was like, you know, rode the bench pretty hard. Um, and in college I like jogged, but I didn't identify as an athlete. I had been explicitly told by people I loved and trusted that I wasn't an athlete. And so I think a big part of the athletic growth process for me has been unlearning those narratives, not taking them with me and saying like, you know what, and like part of being an athlete is telling yourself that you're an athlete and, uh, not, you know, depending on other people to validate your worth or athleticism and using your work to validate the athleticism um, and knowing that your worth is innate and cannot be changed by anything you do or do not do. So I had to really unlearn a lot of that. I also, you know, came in with different struggles around like restrictive eating and exercise over dependence. And I always told myself that to be an athlete, I had to do the most. I had to always be doing more than was prescribed. I had to do it harder. And I had to like, when I felt tired, not rest, but push through it. And I think that that, you know, early on in my career caused some really unhealthy cycles of like overtraining burnout and just like hormonal issues coupled with under fueling. So I think for me, like the good news is, is, I mean, it's kind of like the hardest, like yourself is like always going to be the final boss and the hardest to beat. Right. Um, and I think it's less about beating than more about working with and I think that thankfully I've overcome a lot of those challenges. Like I now no longer struggle to fuel myself during or after runs. I no longer um, carry a lot of baggage about not being enough of an athlete. Like sure, those thoughts, those feelings definitely still do show up for me, but they're also not feelings that I allow to drive my decision-making processes. So I'm really proud of that. And I feel like more than like, have, like sure, I've had injuries and like setbacks there, but I think that you know, the biggest thing has just been learning to work with my own brain and kind of the like neurological hand that I've been dealt and to be accepting of that, to be loving of it, to show up with tenderness and curiosity about that. Um, but to also not let stories from my past define how I show up now. Mm, I think that's so important. And that's something we've really been talking a lot about on the last several podcast we've done is developing that way of being detaching from old stories that might be holding us back and developing new stories that support the where we want to go that support right. the direction we want to take things the goals that we have the big dreams that we have um and it's you know remarkable how much as people um we tend to get in our own way. We'll uh, tell ourselves, you know, we're not ready to go for that goal or we're not good enough. We're not worthy enough. Um, you know, we'll get stuck in what, uh, what Jeff always calls the small vision syndrome. Um, and that's always, it's not always, but it's often linked to those stories. And, you know, everybody has, I was just, you know, having a discussion about this over the weekend where I, I feel um, nobody goes through this life unscathed. Everybody has multiple points of pain, reckonings, um, moments that 
challenge their identity, their way of being. Um, and those are really, those can be very defining moments. And although sometimes they're very um, uh, tangible, like, yeah. like an allergy diagnosis, like, oh, you have uh, severely allergic to over 25 outdoor allergens. That's why you can't run. Oh, okay. That's, that seems very tan. I can understand that. And then sometimes it's like, you know, I just have a really overactive inner critic. Yeah. And it's something that like, is just like, you know, that's kind of what I heard you describing. It's like, oh yeah, like my biggest challenge is myself. And I, in a lot of ways we all have that, but in other ways, some people have that more than others. I think I've met several people who just have that like that inner critic can, can be like a force of good when it's turned into a coach or you learn to work with it, like you mentioned, or yeah. it can be that thing that just like holds you back. Yeah. And I always try to like, you know, I don't think my goal has ever been to fully silence the critic. It's to be aware of it and to say like, Hey, thanks. I really love that. You're trying to keep me safe. I love that. You're trying to protect me in this moment, but I don't think you're helpful in this decision-making process. So like you can come along for the ride, but you don't get to drive. Do you ever, distinguish between the fact that you know there's like a, a standard that you might have and then there might be like a something that's like an unrealistic thought or a, a perfectionist tendency there and it's like there's a difference between having like the critic being like okay you didn't hit your standard today right or there might be rather than like the other part of that that could be like you're you are not good enough you're not hitting like the, you're not getting the numbers you're supposed to be getting, like, et cetera. Oh, totally. Especially like signing up for super competitive races, you know, like qualifying and trying to, and trying to compete at Western States. I struggled with that a lot. And I think it was even harder when I like very clearly fell short of like my expectations and what like anyone's like, re like no one goes to that race to like DNF at mile 80. Like that's no one's desired outcome. Um, and you can't hide from it, right? Like everyone wants to talk about it. Everyone wants to ask you about it. Um, even at, you know, my last 50 miler, like fell short of expectations. Um, don't love like the perfectionist in me doesn't love that, but also the like super resilient learner and student of the sport does love that. And I think it's like continuing to feed the person who's curious rather than like a perfectionist is incurious. You're not curious. Like if you're trying to be perfect, you don't care about what your potential is because you're care, you're caring about, you're caring more about perception than what you actually do and like how you actually respond to adversity. So I always try to operate from a posture of curiosity rather than like rigidity and perfection. Yeah. Like perfectionism is really linked to that. It's like you conscious ego side right. of us. And there's like a definite outcome. Yes. External and validation. You're, you're trying, like, it's such a flawed way of thinking that I know that we all fall into of like, you know, black and white, like I can, you know, this will happen. Like if I fall short of this, it's not enough. And I think curiosity is more challenging and how nuanced it is. And you still have to like be vulnerable and like open yourself up to falling short of what your expectations are, but still have the courage to maneuver around that as well. Yeah. And it sounds to me like, you know, your, your new story or identity way of being is about that curiosity, that growth, the learning, um, and always trying to have that lens be involved in that inner dialogue um, and I think those are very positive things because those things perpetuate the process forward. They're a lot less judgmental. Totally. Perfectionism is so judgmental. Like you mentioned, it's either you did it or you didn't. You hit this, you hit the expectation or you didn't. And that's really different than having like a standard where like maybe your standard is like, yeah. I'm going to go to this race and give my best. Totally. And as soon as I like early on, like when I was like, when I was in my early twenties and I identified that like, you know, again, coming in with a disordered eating background, coming in with like some, like a, some mental health context that didn't necessarily set me up for success. I identified that like, I am going to need a team. Like I, 
I want to reach my potential as a runner, I have identified that these are going to be barriers if they're not addressed. So I dedicated a lot of time and resources to addressing those barriers. And I can just say it was life changing for me, like working um, with like a, a having a long term relationship with a mental health professional, um, working to like get my nutrition and like the ways of fueling myself and seeing myself back on track. And I would just urge anyone who has identified those as being barriers for me, those were not going to go away on their own. I needed to have a team of folks to help me like really identify the root causes of some of those teams, some of those issues. And it's going to be an ongoing process for me as well. Like recovery is kind of a forever state for me. And, you know, shout out to everyone else for whom that is a reality as well. And if you've identified that like you have like stories that are holding you back, that you have patterns that are holding you back, white knuckling it is usually not the answer, right? Like work, like efforting harder is usually not the answer. Try something different, recruit people to your team, recognize that you deserve that level of help and assistance. Um, and your coaches are partially here to help you in that process, but there's also lots of other professionals that are available to give that help as well. So again, just like if you've identified, like in the same way that like when TJ identified that allergies were going to be a barrier to his potential, he recruited a team to help him out. Right. And I think a lot of times we don't treat our mental health and our fueling in that same way. We don't treat like the narratives we have in our stories in that same serious way. And I think we should, right. Cause like a lot of it comes down to like issues of self-worth, mental health, um, emotional health, address those things, take them seriously, get the help you need and deserve. So that would be my little takeaway for athletes out there. I love it. And I think that there's just, I like how there's so much, there's so many parallels. And I bet you, if we, if we zoomed out and took a sample of all of our athletes challenges and what they've gone through, if getting through those things probably involved developing a team, yeah, probably involved addressing some of the, the inner, the inner thoughts, like the inner world that we all have, um, that not enough um, kind of mentality that is really prevalent in running. Um, but especially it's just really prevalent in just human existence, just being oh, a yeah. person, um, on this earth. Uh, it almost... Oh my goodness. Are you going to love one of the <laughs> subplots of the Barbie movie? My friend <laughs> sounds great. I can't say it with me. It. I am Knuff. 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 What is that all? It's about? like, can't enough, but with a K Knuff. Like Ken off, like Ken yeah, ball. like I am Ken and I am enough. Oh, okay, I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, all right, that's cool. Um, anyways, just think there's a lot of parallels yeah. there. Um, and again, like we are all probably so much more alike in going through these challenges, and I think then we all maybe believe at first, and then don't use this as an opportunity to isolate. Yeah. Use as an opportunity to bring people in. Yes. I think that's where the real oh, um, yeah. Absolutely. important stuff starts to happen when you get vulnerable with others, you invite other people in to help you or to just be active listeners or supporters. Yeah. Build your team. Build your team. You are enough. <laughs> All right. Let's get into some hot or not. Hot or not. Ooh, I feel like... I, yeah, I feel like we're going to be pretty in alignment on this one. Taking breaks from training and working with a coach. Uh, very not hot. Very not hot. Yeah. Not just from like a job security standpoint, but like, ugh, like I, I, I feel like they're just like, it, like there are people who understand that taking a break is just like not the way to get them where they need to. Like, there's just like, it's, it's almost like two different personality types. And I'm always trying to reconcile that in my coaching. I just don't believe in breaks. So it's really hard for me to be compassionate and empathetic when I'm approached to an approach by an athlete who wants to take a break, um, especially because they're going through something. I, my firm belief is that's the time to double down on the people who support and believe in you yeah. most. It's the time to stay curious and find alternative pathways. Homemade snacks, homemade snacks on race day. I'm a, I'm a gnaw dog on that. I'm not hot. That's just a recipe for a GI disaster. Yeah, that sounds like an expensive GI disaster. <laughs> <laughs> All right. These are easy today. Born to run. I'm like, okay. I th The book, fine. Not my favorite. I'm going to give it like a lukewarm. What I hate is that whenever you tell someone you're an ultra runner, that's like the first thing they ask you. 
That's- so like, I think that the book in and of itself, totally fine. Men asking me if I've read it when I am in fact, the editor in chief of the world's largest trail running publication, not hot. So you've never read it. That's what I'm hearing. I have read it. You've read it? Yes. Cover to cover? Chris McDougal is a darling man, but I also like his book about the donkey better. Running with Sherman. Oh, I don't know that one. I am familiar with Born to Run. I've read it once. Hot or not? It's pretty hot. I like it. Um, I think it's also really problematic. Yeah, there's Uh, some challenging. There's some stuff in there. Yeah, shoes, great. Like shoes are positive, would endorse the wearing of shoes as opposed to salvaged tires with thread. Um, also problematic representation of indigenous communities. But we've oh. all learned, we've all grown. I don't think it's helpful to criticize people for like not knowing what we know now either. Totally. And I think that it's a great entry point and very inspiring for a lot of athletes. I know that that is one of the things that, you know, I read that book and was into running and I was like, oh, this is cool. Like you can go further than seven miles. If I had a dime for every athlete that emailed us that was like, I just ran Born to Run. Now I'm running Leadville. I'm running 15 miles a week. Can you help? Like (laughs) we could buy a Barbie dream house. Ooh. Okay. Plyometrics, hot or not? (sighs) Yeah. Uh, again, lukewarm. It so depends. I don't think that they're, they're definitely not a cure-all. Like sometimes they're represented um, by some in the strength space. I think they can be really helpful, particularly for building eccentric strength for running faster downhills, but don't overdo it. Um, like I think that doing too many is worse than doing none at all. I think they're hot if and when done with a strength coach. Yeah. <laughs> It depends. Right. <laughs> the hottest like, answer of all. Nobody likes that in the middle answer, but definitely but can it's so be true. Hot. And it's such like a coach's answer. I feel like whenever you have a coach who doesn't say it depends a lot, like run, don't walk. <laughs> okay. The NA beer. Hot. So hot. Yeah. Agreed. What's your favorite kind? I'm really into the groovy, juicy IPA. G-R-U-V-I. They're based out of um, the front range. It's the best... IPA I've tried the best in a IPA like it's super heady super juicy I think it feels like like it's a bit more premium than athletic it's not like a low calorie option either which I actually really enjoyed that like the goal isn't to just like have something that's as close to water as possible it's to like have a really rich tasty experience that's not centered around the alcohol yeah uh the um blue can athletic brew co yeah blue the can. run the, the classic run wild can. IPA that's my favorite mm. That's a real staple for us. Yeah. Okay, beam, hot or not? Uh, hot. I love it, man. I feel like it really does help me sleep. Even though like, I've never tried a CBD product that I thought was helpful. I guess this does have CBD in it, and I do find it. I know it also has like melatonin and reishi in it, which I've never said out loud. Things that I'm like, this sounds... I need to see the research. But I will say that if I do beam in the evening, knocks me right out. Yeah, I find it to be pretty hot. If yeah. you're in the middle of a training cycle, it's hard to fall asleep or you're traveling tough to get back into your rhythm. Uh, it is definitely should be in every athlete's cabinet in there. We're not getting stand. paid by the way. I wish yeah, we were. This stuff's sponsored. expensive, <laughs> <laughs> but it's really worked for us. Yeah. Yeah. We like sleep. Love it. All right, guys, thanks so much. Uh, As usual, if you have any feedback, a question for a future call, or are looking for support in your running journey, please visit us on the web at microcosm-coaching.com or contact us at microcosmcoaching at gmail.com. See you next time.